do. And, and now I guess we're recording. We're recording now. It's sound checking. Check sounds. Someone, I guess we're, we're live streaming. So. Yeah. Someone told us that we could cut out the first minute of banter on the show and just get right to the point. Which is... I don't think he realized the whole show is just the stupid banter, so... Yeah, like, that's a podcast. You talk. Yeah. So, sorry. If, if you got all the way through the hour of the show and were still pissed off by the first minute you heard, eh, this might not be the show for you, man. But, like, kudos on you for sticking around, man. We appreciate your feedback. Yeah, if only the first minute was a problem, then... Yeah, just push through it, man. Yeah, just push through this first minute. You'll get there. You'll get to the gold that doesn't exist on the other side of it. So, speaking of which, which, I'm your host, Luke Madrid, and this is my co-host... What's your name, man? Andrew Haskins. Yeah, and we have a Patreon now. You yeah, just, and what's what's this Patreon you just for? Search, it's it's for us because no, we're name, poor. The name of the show, dude. Oh yeah, it's called the Whole Rabbit. In case where, you where weren't we aware. Where we don't just what? Oh, where we don't just tell the rabbit that it's worshiping the wrong gods. No, no, no. We destroy its altar and then like assemble a new one and make a blood sacrifice of it to the proper god. We are talking about. The old gods today. Yeah, the old gods. Like who are they? There's more than just one worshipped stupidly by different religions. It used to be. When you first introduced the idea of the show to me, I thought it was going to be a show about the ancient ones. I I I kind of figured you you got that drift from like 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 I thought this was going to be about the Necronomicon. Oh no no, this is like the the lycanthropy and cryptids. Okay. You know, we gotta so, be careful. We really gotta touch base in what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> what, how, who are the old gods, and what's the deal with them anyway? We've talked about the Goetia on the show quite a bit. Oh, yeah. About, there's different ways to conjure demons. There's different modes of thought about how to deal with them and what they're good for. And some people dispute what they are entirely. But... One thing is certain, if you go back and you look at the 72 names, they're usually based off of an older god. Of an ancient culture, you know, usually some city-state. Yeah, it's a god that's usually associated with a city-state, an aspect of nature, or an aspect of life, and it has been changed into a strange little Pokemon demon in the Goetia, in the spirits of the Goetia. So we thought, hey, why don't we go back and look at some of these old gods and See if we can figure out how they made their transformation into demons. Yeah, let's do that. And uh, I actually went and read the entire Call of Cthulhu. Well, I didn't read anything because I found an audiobook. Because I don't read fiction. Yeah, yeah, fiction's not meant to be read. It's meant to be heard. I like listening. I like listening to fiction. And then I like reading what we currently know as nonfiction, which eventually becomes fiction because we get more updated ideas. Yeah. Everything I read about string theory is apparently not Oh no, dude, emergence current. emergence theory is where it's at. I don't even think that's a normal I don't think that's a scientific community thing. But we're well we won't go into that. That's another show. We're trying to talk about ball. Well like balls. We're we're trying to talk about old gods, but let's start with the first guy, which is the first spirit of the Goetia, which is Baal. That is the or, first spirit, isn't it? That's where. That's why I started there. Yeah, or Baal, or Beelzebub. It's kind of a, a funny trick that they do with this first spirit because... So is this the god of the internet? Because it appears to be like... A cat, a frog, and some weird troll face. It's like a troll... You know, yeah, it maybe, is like, maybe, yeah, probably. I won't say what, but it's oh, kind of one of the, it's like one, it's like the racist meme. Oh, and spider legs. It's like the hands rubbing together <laughs> racist meme, wink, wink, that you see everywhere on the internet. And then the, and then Keck and, you know, Catterday or, uh, Nyan Cat or what? No, but that like, is the internet. Is Ball Run the internet? <laughs> and so the spider legs would be like the whole web idea. Oh, yeah, the web. Because yeah. it's all got on spider legs. Yeah, anyways. So, I'm convinced. We can just stop the show now. Yeah, we, we've uncovered the mystery. Even the... The internet's a demon. Inter- d- yeah. <laughs> oh my god, why, why did it have to be so? <laughs> Maybe that's just the spirit of 4chan. Oh, okay. Maybe Ball is just 4chan, and that's why it thinks everything else is a pleb. Yeah, like the uh, 
Or, or something even worse, like maybe the person who started 4chan summoned Ball to like get it going. Oh, conspiracy! We're, yeah. that, you heard it here. Yeah. We created and fabricated this conspiracy <laughs> before anyone else. I can't believe no one thought of it. I'm sure somebody has. It's 4chan. Yeah, you want to get it rid just, of 4chan, you send Christian magic at it or something. That place is scary. Ball's like this interesting character because he shows up and the first... He's like the first king, he's the first spirit... He's pretty gnarly. The picture of his description is kind of funny, and we totally have like the internet, our our new internet image. He's the now. first king of hell yeah. with estates in the east. Whatever, the, I, I guess that means he's like a an airy sort of spirit. But anyways, he's also one of the seven princes of hell. Yeah. Okay. So ball used to be like a term. They would use for any sort of god, like household deities and like ancestral gods. And it meant lord. Yeah, it meant lord. It's like the same as the Jewish Adonai. Like, in fact, like the Hebrews, what they used to do is they would make fun of people and call their gods Baal Zabab, which is lord of flies. So. Like stinky poop. Yeah, basically they're calling their god shit. And like, that's the whole concept of beelzebub it's like it's a fabrication of a mistranslation of like fucking with somebody else because you know their god's not good enough well even right there lord of the flies and calling somebody else's god shit that's the root of the word shaitan s-h-t shit shaitan it's all in the mix so is that how baal became the chief devil of the hebrews or hebrew pantheon i don't even know what to call it the judeo-christian world i guess you could say yeah i guess it would be like a hierarchical worldview because early in the the hebrew culture baal wasn't like all bad because baal specifically i think baal hamon because as we said baal just meant like lord but baal hamon or in a more generalized that's usually what people are referring to when they say baal yeah baal hamon and this is a fertility god of the rain and uh the seasons and there's and thunder god he's basically like the mesopotamian thor and odin you know he's like kind of rolling around doing his own thing he's responsible for fertile soil prince and lord of the earth you kind of need him there if you if you want stuff to grow and you want stuff to eat my understanding of this god's story from what i've heard i don't know if it was i think it was like the canaanite version of of the story but he basically was a dick god and he would just like go around and fuck with people and he was really cruel and just like so cruel that he like compelled his his father l to like punish him and fuck with him l is even like he's part of the pantheon of the of the jewish scheme because from what i understand of kabbalah l was associated with hesed and is like the god of like like more of like the patriarchal sort of father figure god but no oh, that's right i that would make sense why l would be associated with hesed because l is sort of the head of the pantheon and Baal is sort of in a struggle to kind of like live up to that or like maybe supersede that, which does play into the Lucifer myth. Yeah, absolutely. But so does um, Asherah. So we'll get into that later. But in terms of Baal, he tries to get a palace comparable in size to El and he persuades El's wife, Asherah, to intercede and authorize the construction of the palace, I guess. So you have to get, basically he had to get his one, he had to get his rival's woman. Yeah. To, to, to actually, like, go along with it. I guess he was also worshipped in Egypt in the later kingdom. And the Babylonians pr- pronounced his name Bel, which um, later became associated with Zeus uh, through the Greek Belos. So, so there you have it. So you were saying like he's kind of a dick. Yeah, he's kind of a douche god. He was also like the lord of destruction. Wasn't as well. Zeus kind of a? I don't want to get struck by lightning now. Well, but yeah, he was kind of a douche god, right? A That's lot of a... a lot of the gods were douche gods, and they, like that they were was all the thing. douche gods. Yeah, they're all the problem. Yeah, like they they weren't worth worshiping. Really, okay, when it came okay, down to okay. It. But this is a show about the old gods. I feel like perhaps we've slipped. Well, we were going to talk about the origin of the spirits in the Goetia, but there are older gods than these, right? Like the Titans. Yeah, yeah. And the Titans were like the personification of like elemental forces. Chaos itself. Yeah, like the ocean itself, the earth itself, like the sky itself. So like Tiamat. Yeah. And the gods come out about from these tidal forces and they kind of become 
like living embodiments like almost like humanized representations of these forces that's a good way to look at them right the gods as projections of our own or maybe the projections of our own mastery you know of like an element like we can perceive of mastering an element so much that like it becomes a personified idea yeah and that's what most of the gods started off at the beginning like the god of the hunt is the master hunter and this is very jbp by the way like uh, of a look at it is that like the god of the hunt is the master hunter. He's the guy whose arrow always strikes true. This is like, that's like the whole idea. And then you go, okay, well, I'm going to worship the god of the hunt because I want my arrow to strike true every time. Like, it just becomes a very obvious thing that like, it moves from, we understand this as a personification or projection of something we want to happen into a little idol that you, you start hoping that if i give this little statue some freaking booze you know it, it'll help me on my way to do the thing i wanted to do yeah so ball became like the you know the master of the sky because that's where the rain comes from yeah and also the lightning so you're just like okay so he masters lightning and he rides clouds and you know the wind blows really really strong i'm pretty sure okay so this character ball is portrayed in the uh expansion diablo 2 lord of destruction that's where most of us are familiar with ball right well okay so the association is smack dab on and they actually made the face of their little cgi character look like the picture how so like the old school picture this picture of the human face in the you know between the frog and the cat they made him look like that and they also gave him the spider legs like in the old school picture. If you if anyone like looks it up, it's looks Oh, you're right. They did. They made him look kind of like uh, his description. Yeah, it's I realized that later on down the line and I when I lo- went back at Diablo 2 cuz it's way more fun than Diablo 3 and I was like, "Oh, wow, they actually put that character in the game. Like they made that character." Which is pretty cool. Now, as you were saying, there's an, another ball who's the same character, but a different, like... See, this is where it really gets all, like, ugh. who is confused about what? And and it, is it us or is it the universe? And even here, if you look up Ball Bareth, it's not really clear who they're referring to. If they're, if there's two not, different... Not Ball Bearing. Right. Ball Bareth. If they're referring to L, or if they're referring to the separate Baal character character that's more associated with Hadad. I think. I thought Barith was actually a location or a city. There you have it. It's how these names change meaning and glob on to other things over time. And then by the time you get to the Goetia, now it's like you've got this Baal spirit in the top of the list of spirits is the number one. And then you got to scroll way down to find this like great duke, which is called Barith. And he, he's only got 26 legions of demons under his command. It just seems like there's a little bit of confusion that embodies these demons themselves, even. Yeah, like, the, they're, they're confused themselves. But the whole tradition almost seems confused, in a way. I mean, not, shots fired. I mean, how many different demons do you need for the same ancient god? About several, because we haven't even touched on, like, all of it. Because we're still on ball, man. This guy keeps going. We haven't even hit Amun, Ra, or Amon. Okay. Well, let's 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 Which... let's wrap up ball. Because ball ball Hamon Hamon is symbolized by a bull head, and yeah. he's got like the lightning bolts in his hand and a club. I think that could be associated with Zeus right there with the lightning bolts. Yeah. The, the bull head plays right into that Moloch. But it's not connection. But it's not necessarily Greek. Because it's a little bit farther farther east. So what what's the Moloch, Andrew? Okay, so... Let's go dark. This is the one thing on the show I didn't really want to bring up right away. Because it's so dark, I really don't even like to talk about it. This is the, probably the one area of occultism that really spooks me out. We talked a little bit about it in the game of Saturn. The idea of, like, ritual sacrifice. Especially in a way that is, like, super dark and terrible. So what is the Moloch, Andrew? Okay. Hit us with the Moloch. Okay, so, like... They were talking in in the Bible, like basically you uh, there there were the the Canaanite freaking or Philistine I forget what they were, but basically they were worshiping Baal Baal the the idea of the conceptualization of the demonic 
character ball. Like that's what they like ball ham on. Yeah. The the bull. Yeah, the bull. And they would conduct rituals called the Moloch. And the Moloch was they had this gigantic big ass thing. It was a A big brass furnace. Yeah, big brass furnace. Thank you. I totally slipped on my on my words. Alright, so they had like a furnace or a kiln and it was had this big giant bull man statue on top. With his hands outstretched. Yeah. yeah. Like and, holding. And they would have a big ass fire inside and you basically you would it, they would take people's babies, put it on the hands and then kill them. And then you just like just next one next one and this would just go all day and yeah. all night yeah it was it's like a horribly frightening affair and like so the the idea was that like to worship baal you have to perform a moloch which is some sort of industrialized slaughter now we see moloch embodied in the film metropolis metropolis it goes like moloch and he sees the factory transform into this beast where they're it consumes it's consuming the workers in flames they're being fed to it as a sacrifice fast forward to the modern day or i guess now we're we're dad aged so go back to the alex jones days when he's breaking out the bohemian grove thing oh yeah yeah they everyone says that like people at the bohemian grove are worshiping moloch no nay nay they are performing a moloch and worshiping Baal? Baal. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, because like everyone's like, oh, it's this giant owl statue, and it's really not. When you look at it in the firelight, it looks like some bullheaded figure with like big ass shoulder plates and shit, like with like a cape on. Well, when we're talking, it's... it looks like some sort of cool D and D figure, like clad in armor, with like a bull head on top, like in the right firelight from the pictures, like. When if you just look it up on Google, and we know enough about psychedelics to to um, conclude yeah. that if you were under their influence, that rock could take on various different forms, especially if oh, it's, it'd keep changing forms, uh, but they'd all be the same evil thing looking back at you. Especially if it's been ritualistically charged with the burning of human flesh under it. But it's, isn't that something that the old gods like? Yeah, that's the thing about the old gods. They liked blood. They like killing things. They like brutalness. It's like, you know how like when Midsummer, like they just like smash that dude's face in with the hammer. Yeah. Yeah, that's normal. Yeah, <laughs> like like back then that was just normal. Like that's really how I took that movie when I was watching it. It's like, oh yeah, they're just living in the ancient times. Since every ninety years we smash people's faces in, but like you know. I did a write up on our Patreon how the whole movie is a reversal of The Shining. And right. it's it's almost all it's it's there intentionally and th so before so go subscribe to our Patreon it's five bucks a month it would be helping us and you get your shows early but before we get into that The Shining plays a lot into this idea of the bull and the sacrificing of children back and, to The Shining man yeah it's it's gonna come it was in our first episode it's always gonna it's, come back to The Shining we're gonna somehow get to Aleister Crowley I know it. The whole happens. point, the 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 term shining is referring to the ability to see Fnords. So in a Fnord hunting show, it's it's reasonable that we would return to the shining frequently. The bull in the shining is there and the motif of human sacrifice is there in the film and the sacrificing of your child is there. And what else did I want to say? Like that's that was Stanley Kubrick trying to say that is this the secret? Religion is this the uh, is this the club is this the the ball you get to join in? Oh, yeah. No, oh, I didn't even notice that. Until oh I, wow! Until wow. I just you, said had to, you had to actually come around to it. Yeah. So it. so instead of the May Queen, you become part of the ball. Yeah. You become Bell of the Ball. You become the Bell of the Ball, and you become cowbell. The bull. I need more cowbell. You become the bull. In the labyrinth, in the maze, you become Daedalus, its creator that falls into it, basically. Oh, yeah, and because there's also that hidden theme inside The Shining about uh, the genocides in general, like from the Holocaust to the Indian genocide. And isn't there this thing in the Bible where people were worshipping Baal under the title of Saturn, Kronos? Like, there's an association between Baal and Kronos? Well, that's because... They both have the beard. I'm not sure on Kronos. I... See, this is it. All these gods sort of glob together in some way, don't they? Oh, yeah, because... We're they, not we, even to we, Venus we, yet. We've gotten there, and now we can move on because we actually got to, to bring up the Moloch. And now we can move on to Amun, which 
Amun's at like Amon in the Goetia, who's like ninth or something like that, and he's he's Amun Ra from or Amun because when he combines with Ra, he becomes goes from like the most powerful to like the ultimate powerful. I've seen God. that. And he's like he's like the Goku of gods. I've seen this in yeah, I've seen this in Dragon Ball Z abridged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I knew you were gonna get there. Like you get these two <laughs> powerful gods and they combine and uh yeah, they they know how to do fusion. So who's Amun Ra? Because we talked a lot about Ra okay, so, and the War God on Arthalema episode, but who's Amun Ra? Okay, so Amun is basically a ram-headed god. If you're ever looking at the pictures of the Egyptian gods, he's the guy with like two horn things. They don't look like horns, but they're supposed to be horns, like two bulbish things popping out of his skull or his little crown. They look like two baguettes. Okay, yeah, he's got like baguette head and like... He's Amun, and he's like the the most powerful god, and he's uh, he's holding the Ankh by the round part. He's kind of like the Jupiter god. He's like totally the the Zeus of the Egyptian pantheon, and he was the biggest god in the Egyptian thing. Like we're all like Osiris, Osiris. It's like no, no, no. Osiris had to do with like death rituals. Amun had to do with life and fucking power and shit. Yeah, because Osiris is more associated with the underworld. Yeah, and, re- and plants and, and, and reincarnation and shit. Well, we also just said Baal Hamon was associated with Zeus. And yeah, yeah. And here's Amun being associated yeah. with Zeus. This is exactly it. Is it's that globbing like, together. That they're all globbing together because there's another character called Amun, or uh, um, yeah, Amon. Now, he's Amun, but there's a character in the Goetia called Amon, and he's like this like wolf faced thing you know with like snake tail this is the most, like a bird faced wolf or some shit it's like the most hideous looking demon in the galatia but its sigil is really pretty yeah it's got a really really nice looking sigil and i wish i had more info on this sigil because i bet it corresponds to something else because there's like six s's well here's the thing is when i did my whole goetia experience with this spirit like literally the room dropped in temperature about like five ten degrees like it got cold in the room and it was almost like i was like looking down like a gigantic sandstone like doorway into like a hallway i think if you look on the la malo duquette deck for which deacon it corresponds to i think this is the one that corresponds to our birthday so it's possible that it has some stronger resonance with us because of our birthday. Yeah, but I, I to- think I totally had like an Egypto vibe from what I was feeling and kind of like seeing in my imagination while I was like summoning the spirit. It really made me think that it was connected to the Amun, Amun Ra character. But then again, it's like the same spirit when you get up to the higher and higher like spots. Maybe maybe they fall, like maybe they energetically like disintegrate and they turn into like Smaller and smaller components of, of like whatever their their vibration entails. Ancient dot EU says Amun is the ancient god of the sun and air. He's also a ram god, so he's he's depicted by a ram, which is an association with Aries. So he's got that going for him. Well, he's the self created one, so the bornless one, and he becomes sort of like this all powerful god in which all the other gods like become aspects of him. So he's that's his quality is to sort of like as a sun god, I guess, is to accumulate all the other gods into him. That's sort of a solar force thing to do is to become the center of something and to have everything be in your orbit. Actually, that's totally like mystery school shit because you're supposed to like learn that you're like projecting all of the world outside of you. So like everybody else, you start to like identify with the sun, like Amun becomes Amun-Ra. Everything outside of himself becomes a part of himself, an yeah. aspect of himself. This one honorific title was Amun rich in names, so he can only be fully understood in terms of all the aspects that are combined in him. Oh, wow. That's that's pretty dope. Yeah, so like he was basically the big god. He was the head honcho. He was the god of like wealth and power of freaking royalty and rulership below him because him and his consort basically echoed into the isis osiris theme so that's so we've okay so we've sort of deduced just in this conversation that maybe kubrick was alluding to the fact that the elites worship a ball then i said maybe this was associated with saturn or the chronos worship we talked about in the game of saturn yeah 
because you know if you're sacrificing kids to this deity that corresponds also with Kronos and eating kids and being a dick um, you, well like the also the thing is is you're kind of like if you're trying to do weird reincarnation schemes into your own family you're also ruining your ch- your kids lives because you're like screwing with their karma as well because they have to give birth to you you know kind of kind of nonsense and you're looping back into your your yeah. own yeah so okay so we've sort of faced the dark side of baal of amun of the bull now we're gonna what about horus horus do we want do you do we want to talk about horus right now um yeah let's talk about his demonic counterpart because which one's his demonic counter counterpart it was Flauros, remember? Flauros. I had someone else identify uh, Person also. Oh, yeah, Person. Person mm-hmm. was, uh, wait, as Horus? Mm hmm. Oh, really? Yep. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And I know that Os was the god of lycanthropy. Like, he was an actual god, you know? Pretty sure Matt Groening worships Pazuzu, who's like a freaking Babylonian deity. Okay, so who's, who's Horus? We already talked about who Horus is in our Thelema episode. We talked about Horus quite a bit. Yeah, but he has a demonic counterpart in the Goetia, and it's Flauros, from what I've what I've learned. Well, let's stop talking about the dude gods. Let's talk about the ancient goddesses, because... If we're going to talk about old gods, we can jump right off of the ball, Phallus, and head on over to Venus Town, because in the ancient world, Venus was the best thing ever. It was like the very first god humans ever worshipped. Venus was the ish, literally. Venus, the worship of Venus was was a big thing. If you look up Venus as an archetype, or if you look up usually almost any woman god in this area of the world, it goes back to Inanna, which is a personification of Venus and is associated with love, beauty, sex, desire, fertility, war, justice, and political power. So pretty much everything. It's not about marriage. Didn't say did it say childbirth? No. Yeah, so it's not about children. It's about sex and yeah. power. It's about sex and power. Yeah, it's, like, it's not about grain, you know. Sex and power. Sex and power and war. And kicking ass and looking beautiful, you know. Fucking this idea. Sexy. So Inanna was in Sumer, worship 4,000 years ago to about 3,100 years ago, which is only about, like, nine 900 years, you know? Jesus had a way longer run than that. Yeah, she didn't have much of a cult prior to the conquest of Sargon of Akkad. Uh, during the post-Sargonic era, she became the most venerated deity of all but, the but, Sumerians. But Sargon of Akkad is an atheist. Oh, wait, he's a YouTuber. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we're, talking, we're talking about actual Sargon of Akkad. So she had temples all across Mesopotamia, uh, she was associated with sexual rights. She basically became Astareth, who was a more Hellenized version of this goddess, and eventually became Aphrodite. So Inanna becomes Astareth, becomes Aphrodite. So uh... One of the blessings that she had was she stirs confusion and chaos against those who are disobedient to her, speeding carnage and inciting the devastating flood, clothed in terrifying radiance. It is her game to speed conflict in battle, untiring, strapping on her sandals. I don't know what the strapping on her sandals thing is getting at exactly. You gotta have sandals to fight, I guess. Yeah, you have to have sandals strapped on, like, tight, you know, like in your war gear. You gotta come strapped. Yeah, you, you, I go strapped. You know I go strapped. So, like, when they're robbing the bank in the Rammstein videos... They go strapped. Yeah, they're going in, like, they're going in a Nana style. So what's this whole... Okay, I thought about this last night. So she's like Ari, Ares? Ares? Ah, uh, not quite. She's she's more like the original Ares. In fact, the more I studied Inanna and Ashtaroth and Ishtar, I began to wonder why Mars is even the god of war or why Ares is the god of war because in the ancient world, the god of war was Venus. It might have just been because well, you like, had to get up before your enemy. Or you, at least you knew when the sun was coming up and you had to get ready to fight. Something like that. I don't know. Well, the thing was that Mars usually shows up in March. And that's when you march. So it had the associations of war. But, like, I'm totally on, on the on the idea that, like, Mars was totally, like, a female force. You know? Just, like, well, and, how and crazy ho- and devastating it is. In Holy Mountain, Mars is a, is a woman. 
and in the Kabbalah, the the sphere associated with Mars is a feminine one. Yeah, it is on the pillar of severity. Yeah, right underneath Bina. And like the one thing about the the all the ancient Mesopotamian gods as opposed to the the Greek gods is they were way crazier. They wanted more blood. You know, they didn't they didn't like go for uh, animal sacrifices. They were into human sacrifices. Battle was oftentimes referred to as the dance of Inanna. Yeah. All the shimmering things flying around and the blood. Oh, and, and the excitement. Doesn't like Poke Runyon and his whole like crew, they do like uh, a Astarte worship? Yes, they do. Because the reason we're talking about it in this episode is because Astaroth, even though it's referred to as a male in the Goetia, is pretty clearly understood amongst the cultists to be, you know female it's female it's it's referring to astaroth or astareth or ashtart ishtar okay so there's this whole thing with astaroth being lucifer the myth of adam and eve uh in in a sumerian hymn inanna and utu describing basically how inanna didn't know anything about sex and so at the beginning of the hymn she doesn't know anything she's totally innocent uh, but she bre- he, she begs her brother Utu to take her to Kerr, which is the Sumerian underworld, so that she can taste the fruit of the tree that grows there. This ultimately will reveal to her all the secrets of sex. Utu complies, and in Kerr, Inanna tastes the fruit and becomes uh, knowledgeable, it's said. Uh, that's a weird incest myth. You think so? I think that's a weird incest myth. Well, what's the whole Adam and Eve thing? That's weird well, like, too. Everyone says Their husband and wife. Yeah, and everyone says it's sexuality that screws it all up. And yeah. to know somebody is to have sex in the Bible, right? I guess so. Or does it like mean something else? Dun dun dun. Like, okay, here's the thing I need to talk to you about is like, you read about all these demons and then the the gods that they're associated with or seem to be the same as, and I'm sure there's more in the Goetia that we haven't really covered. Or even looked up because there's like some like we we have no clue what these things are, like half the ha, ha, like half, I swear half the Goetia has like peacock something, like head of a peacock or something, and I'm assuming that's the like Melik Teos, that King Peacock Angel Lucifer character, you know, kind of even more demonized. So like here's my thing. Well, let's talk about that because you can find these old writings from like a hundred years ago where they're talking about, Oh yeah. If you surround a Yazidi with a circle, they won't be able to get out of it because they're all demon worshipers. And this goes, this actually goes back to what I actually want to talk about because there's this idea of the ancient ones. Oh, we're going there now. Yeah. We're going there now. Oh, I wanted to, Oh, well, uh, what were you going to say? What were you going to oh, say? Oh, I was going to drop Keck before I like, okay, go ahead. Let's talk about Keck for a minute. Well, like everyone knows about Keck by now. I mean, it's just some ancient Egyptian frog god about, like, random number generation. Is that what it is now? I thought it was, like, a god of mischief and, uh... No, it was a god of, like, mathematical number generation algorithms. It was, like, literally like some abstract math god. Are you sure? It was some hermaphroditic math god. <laughs> that's weird. Yeah, but, like, see, that's the thing, is that god came up, like, a couple years ago. And so, like, there's actually this resurgence of all the old gods coming back in our modern culture well like we already said ball is an extension of the internet but you were saying how all these different deities had like peacock feathers and how yeah. it was probably a callback to melek Teus, right well yeah so i have like this thing like maybe these things when they stop being like worshipped and stop being like fed energy they like break down into like lesser components and like you know they think they are different beings themselves but they're all like dis- disassembled pieces of a greater whole Oh, that's an interesting way to look at it. You know, maybe Baal is just like, uh, what was what was the the last bit of his name in the ancient Mesop- uh, ancient Mesopotamians? Oh, Baal Hamon. Yeah, so maybe like Baal or Baal is just like Baal Hamon's like lowered form, like becomes like a slug, like all little mermaid and, then, and shit. And then Barith becomes something else. Yeah, yeah, like some other sh- shaped slug or different colored slug. Well, when you talk about the death cycle in Bardos, it makes some sense because in the Bardo Buddhism tradition, when you die, all these different deities come out of your brain, the wrathful ones, and then 
the beneficent deities come out of your heart and there's a certain number of them that come out of both and so you could see that as the ego breaking down into its component parts as it fails to be uh, a whole so you could maybe see that these old gods that basically were informational cultural networks between different societies once they broke down they could have taken on all these different disparate intelligences or forces that are for the for better or for worse we consider demonic yeah and some might be lashing out at ancient evils long forgotten or like you know ancient slights like blood feuds that we don't understand anymore or care about so in the same sense then we also have small component parts of our ego that are probably not integrated or don't integrate well and those would be the demonic parts of our personality or our subconscious so so we could maybe link those two in the micro and the macro that if we're going to go back and look at our ancestral memory and our dna intelligence that has a corollary in historical cultural terms pretense yeah yeah and those would be the you know these gods that we're talking about well that kind of makes sense with how um poke runyon does his whole magical practice where he summons these ancient deities in their god form like he'll summon the demon and he'd be like come in your like in your highest form come in your like your god form almost you know in his rituals and he'll be like no you gotta summon them you gotta summon them in their glory in their god form you know and they they become good forces to work with rather than like creepy demonic ones okay so what's with the so uh, how do we i want to breach this topic because the, the, the cthulhu stuff yeah because i i like you i said did i did research I, I actually did the research for once you know i was like okay ancient ones and you're like, okay oh. so ancient ones I've, I've been interested in hp lovecraft for a while i just never got around to it i, I think it's all bunk and made up well, obviously, because H.P. Lovecraft wrote it. Yeah, of course. But there's the whole collective unconscious thing. So we wanted to talk about old gods. I thought that meant ancient ones. You brought up the peacocks and the Yazidis. I brought up the draw and the circle around the people and trapping them because they call them demon worshippers. Where are we going with this? It sort of just seems like we're afraid of the past. We're afraid of where these we're afraid of where the deities we worship now might have come from because there's a conflagration here between like w w is there a big difference between Baal and Yahweh and who's El and don't they all sort of end up getting conflated by the time we get to the Bible and, and then in, in Kabbalah they end up taking you know different spheres and different portions of the Godhead itself you know and yeah that's I think that's the, the healthiest way to look at it like these are all different forces but there's like there's like some sort of unified whole that might be worth worshiping. Aren't we sort of fetishizing the past? And isn't that what these demons are? Like, let's just call it what it is. Like, like. Oh, you said you were totally saying it the, the completely other way. You were saying that we're afraid of the past. Now we're fetishizing. Well, what are we doing here, Luke? A little bit of both. You're you're a little too postmodern for my taste. <laughs> okay, it's a little bit of both. Okay, because over here in the Kabbalah, you're like you know. Yahweh ain't even on the tree, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, well, it's it's the it's more of like a state rather than rather than an actual It's more thing. of a formula in Kabbalah. Yeah, rather than an actual S thing. That's why you don't speak it. So we we and can I've have also, okay. So I've also had that heard broken down that like We're confusing the audience. Yeah. This is we could talk about magic theory in Kabbalah, okay? So that's a different that's a different episode. But people want to hear about demons. Yeah, we're talking about demons and gods. Gods oh, and demon gods. So this is what I mean. So on the one hand, we're fetishizing it and we're afraid of it. You go because this is what happens. You look back in the past so and you're we're like, we're scare aroused about it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly my point. And that is what I got out of out of listening to. Oh, so this is just some kinky shit in our subconscious. Well, what is the whole Cthulhu old gods thing really about? Like what is it about? Like oh, that was a good that was a good segue. I, I was. Are you making fun of me? Cause, no, 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 that was actually pretty good. Okay, well, just, <laughs> just some things I I noted before I found out that everyone else knew about this before me. When I was listening to Call of Cthulhu, you know, you're hearing H.P. Lovecraft ramble on, and then the the word Negro fetishism comes up or loathsome faith. 
of the you know the indigenous peoples of wherever and so there and this is a thing that comes up in mystical kabbalah with dion fortune where they associate all religion of anyone that's not white with devil worship including everything in africa voodoo and they're basically saying okay just to spoilers if you're like me and don't know anything about you didn't read call of cthulhu it's not worth it um i thought it was pretty good i'm gonna spoil it right now so turn off the podcast and listen to an hour of it on youtube like i did and save yourself the trouble it's pretty good but it's, but it has honestly it has a pretty anticlimactic ending. Yeah. And by the end of it, I was pretty much like, this is just a a H P Lovecraft's like project like fearful projections of like brown people of, culture. Yeah, brown people <laughs> culture that he doesn't understand and is afraid of. And it really was really perfectly mirrored and echoed in <laughs> Dion Fortune's mystical Kabbalah when she talks about the religion of the dark races and of the dark lands. And spoiler, in Call Cthulhu. You basically have these old gods that come from space, and they're not f- perfectly physical, but they have a physical aspect, and they can transmigrate different planets through the sky when the stars are correct. But when the stars are wrong, they have to go, they have to die and go into a sort of hibernation. And the way that they achieve, the way they overcome this problem is, uh, you know, like Cthulhu and his his old gods are running the earth with all their their gigantic evil machinations, and then the stars change and they have to go into hibernation. So, all their cities like s- fall under the water, and then they entomb themselves in stone, where they're like half dead, half dreaming in stone, and then they reach out psychically in dream form to sensitive people, usually the dark races. Or mulattoes, as it says in the book. They, oh, really? The mulattoes? Th- yeah, and they're drawn... Sailors. They, they, there's a thing about sailors in the book, so, too. So, so, so like, half-breeds... You're demonizing... They get touched by demons. Demonizing anyone that's not a proper white person with nice shoes, you know? So... Oh, man, that, that makes me evil. I don't got nice enough shoes. Your shoes are pretty nice. No, they're not. They're not as good. nice as mine. Yeah. It so happens to be that all these dark races in all these dark places of the world are drawn psychically to these idols and they worship these idols in human sacrifices and they're all naked and they're chanting out the Cthulhu Ka- call. Kalima Shatate. All that stuff, yeah. Kalima Shatate. They're, they're, they're calling out to these old gods and the whole idea is is that these old gods can't get out of the stone. They can't get themselves out of hibernation. Until the stars align again. Until the stars align and the priesthood of this ancient cult that never dies that is composed of all the dark races and the Chinese up in the mountains too. Well, of course the Chinese are doing whatever. They don't give a shit. Yeah, they're all in they're, on it too. It, they're like, is it lucky or is it unlucky? And they're like, oh, it's totally lucky. And it's well, like, oh yeah, we're totally doing it. It's lucky. And then the humans basically have to unwittingly unleash these forces upon the earth, which will create... Uh, uh, you know, in Armageddon revelations, end of the world type situation, the likes of which no one can imagine. But it's spoiler. The, it's spo- Hellboy. Spoiler. It's, it's at Hellboy the, one. Spoiler at the end of the book, they just turn the boat around and ram it with the boat, and it pops like a giant bubble. And then it's like, oh no! I hope nobody reads my papers because the dark people are gonna come and kill me. It makes no sense. It's a horrible anticlimactic ending. It was not what I expected. Yeah. I, I so Helter Skelter, man. Helter Skelter. So I think a lot of the old, so that's like the old gods, the forces of chaos and the, the Titans, basically, that's an idea of the Titans of primordial chaos that the gods that we were talking about, they're more like the middle age gods, really. No, no. We're talking about like ancient gods, like ancient human gods, like human gods. Yeah. Because these are the forces that like slay Tiamat, right? And yeah, this is something closer to that. Because uh, I think, like, Dagon has this uh, a tribute, like, he's equated with Marduk. Well, isn't that what we're seeing, but in a different cycle? This is what I'm trying to say, Andrew, is, like, so when we look at the old gods and we look at the Goetia, it sort of looks like we have this thing where the last gods we had are now our demons. If you look even further back, it's like what we learn about those gods, they're only gods because they overcame the personifications of chaos that came before them or birthed them. 
And then the new gods killed those gods, and then the next yeah, and gods then and here we have gods. like and then yeah, Christianity like here comes Crowley, yeah, Christianity slays those gods, well, and like, then here Je- comes Alistair you know, like, Crowley to kill those gods. Jesus went and beat up Hades and freed all the people from the underworld, and then Alistair Crowley's like, okay, I'm gonna rip apart all the other gods and make yeah, a, make a crazy world where people can be women but are men but are are women but you know you don't know (laughs) so yeah the old gods and the old spirits are about as organized as the spirits in the new super smash brothers game yeah it's a mess oh my god it's a holy mess it's not everything is not perfectly geometrically platonically aligned it's some super symmetry when we're talking about demons and old gods it all globs together and yeah some are just like clones of the other and they're some are faster some hit harder you know and when you look at the baphomet it makes a lot of sense you know you got a male arm and a female arm and you got moons and you got a penis and you got goat hooves and in and it says dissolve and recombine isn't that and that's pretty much what we've seen we've seen our projections of these natural of natural forces which we personified as chaos and we've continued to overlay our personalities and our higher ideals onto them until we just get these shiny, perfect gods that we worship now, which are really just like the newest edition memes of the old gods. Because, like, we did sort of dispense with the Queen of Heaven. That's one thing I did want to talk about a little bit with Astarte or Shara. Like, we got rid of the woman god, like, entirely. Like, the Queen of Heaven. But most of it is... Most of the gods and the demons we're familiar with now... Or just something that we used to worship back in the day. I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty much. Like, well, okay, so here's the thing. Is that, like, what are the gods now that we're worshiping as a culture? Because, like, most people, they may say they're Christians, but they ain't worshiping no Hebrew god. They ain't doing it. They don't even know how to do it. They they can't even, like, conceptualize the concept. I think that's an old god already. Is the actual Hebrew god like it could be considered an old god? Well, is the is the he- old Hebrew god El? No. Again, the like their thing is the the tetragrammaton Elohim. That's that's like their chief deity, but their real deity is the Ihe Asher Ihe, or the I am that I am. The sort of like non-identified being where it's just like I they simply exist. You know, I don't really need a name. Magic. <laughs> yeah, it used to be basically like there was a time when gods were just like they weren't like the end all be all. They weren't like Marvel superheroes. They were just powerful things that could ma- like master forces. And they weren't all like happy unicorn rainbow gods of light, which they are now. If you you know go to the New Testament, or if you go to, or if you look at like any pagan. A neo-pagan yeah. pantheon. It's like everyone's... Well, this one's beneficial. And the god of war, well, he doesn't harm a fly. Yeah, it's, it's all... Like, yeah, no, the Dorian virtue cards, you know? Yeah, it's just like, come the hell on. But as I was looking through the Cthulhu mythos deities, I ran into, like, Kotlaku. And I was like, she of the serpent skirted one. I was like, that's not even made up. That's a real thing. Because I had re- heard about it in school. And lo and behold, it actually was. Kotlaku was this... Um, Earth goddess who got impregnated by a ball of feathers that fell on her while she was sweeping the temple. And lo and behold, she uh, gave birth to, um, well, you know, this crazy Aztec god that I can't pronounce out loud. We, we tried th- for like, a, we tried for a few minutes. Hertz. Hertz. Anyway. Lo, lo, ch- she gave th- birth to like 400 kids and they all tried to kill her, right? And uh, eventually her son protects her. And I think then in some versions of the myth, she either gets torn apart and becomes the moon or she tears the heads off of all the kids and then turns them into the moon. Or her son does who pops out ready for battle and uh, that, straight out of the womb. Yeah, straight out of the womb. Straight out of the womb, this god's ready to battle. Pretty hardcore. Also, important to note, she a has a skirt made of fucking serpents. Also, Serpent skirt. Also, she's lacking a head. Because she was sacrificed. So she's like Medusa. And the blood that's spurting out of her neck is the form of two snakes. So, so. so and that's her head. So she's just snake woman. Like, you just chop her into bits and she squirts snakes. Dude, Cthulhu ain't shit compared to Cote Yeah, if you, and that if they you prick her, she doesn't bleed. She, like, snakes you. And, <laughs> and, and this is ultimately where these old gods come from, in my opinion, to wrap up the episode. I know this from school. Cote they couldn't, like, you couldn't, the Spanish couldn't, like, destroy the statue. 
that like they 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 couldn't get they couldn't get the natives to destroy the Kotlaku statue and they couldn't destroy the statue themselves so they just sort of had to let it exist and they ended up just pushing it into a ditch which is where they found it hundreds of years later completely intact and so there's this idea that this quote unquote dark race continued to worship Kotlaku in the shadows and in the you know the jungles and wherever they could get away with it and well their culture was brutal dude it was so brutal like and ultimately that's that's like what that's what the hp lovecraft terror is generated from is like this like this fear of the past and fear of other races and ancient cultures because this stuff was written down right when like archaeology became a big thing because this wasn't a thing until like the 19 or until like the late 18 the late 1900s early uh 20th century that was a big weird no no 18, thing of time 19, you said there ni- yeah 19th century the steampunk days 20th century <laughs> end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century i said like from the late 20th century to the beginning of the 20th century is what i started off with uh there's a lot of these old gods that are just these gray blobs of goop with tentacles flying out but um yeah i don't know i guess that's the old gods fucking and the and and the ancient ones because the ancient ones they're really just like oh there's like these old gods before your 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 jewish god who slew slew the leviathan and they just pop like a giant bubble anyway so it's yeah, no, yeah it's no big deal yeah they can't handle modern machinery yeah it's no big deal so oh it's 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 all like propaganda it's like oh our freaking industrialization will destroy their ancient gods that's what the call of cthulhu is about hp lovecraft was an atheist and his parents i guess his mom was crazy so all of all, and he he got his ideas from dreams so there you go it was really his his psyche and his subconscious and that's kind of obvious when you go back and read it well that's the whole rabbit eat carrots shoot wait, lasers wait, like where, where can they find us oh yeah where can they find us didn't we do that in the beginning no we didn't all right you can find us <laughs> on Patreon, which is where you should go to give us money, because it's what we really want right now, because it costs us money to do this show, and I'm out of it. But I also got a job, so I'm gonna keep working on it. You can go to next. Sub- you can go what? You can go to Subscribe Star if you don't like Patreon, because you know we're we, not gonna stop you if you don't like a certain service. We don't have a lot on there yet, but we're working on it. Then. Yeah. Uh, we're on Spotify, we're on YouTube, we're on the Apple Play Store, we're on Stitcher, and apparently we're also on like a lot of other podcast apps and websites that BuzzFeed filters through, so we're everywhere. Just look us up on your favorite podcasting platform and we'll be there. I hope you enjoyed the 